Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Kevin Chilton, Explorer Chair for Space Warfighting Studies at the Mitchell Institute Space Power Advantage Center of Excellence. And welcome to the release of our new policy paper titled Orbital Vigilance, the Need for Enhanced Space-Based Missile Warning and Tracking by MySpace's own Christopher Stone. Space-based ballistic missile warning systems developed by the Department of Defense have served our nation well for more than 50 years. Without question, the current geosynchronous and highly elliptical orbit-based architecture is the most advanced ballistic missile warning capability in the world. However, changes in the operational threat environment demand consideration of future architectures for warning of missile attacks on deployed forces, as well as the homeland. In addition to offensive space weapons, that can hold our current warning satellites at risk, China and Russia are fielding a new generation of hypersonic and low-flying missiles that the U.S. ground-based radars are unable to track in time to provide adequate warning and cue defenses. China and Russia are preparing to use these next-generation systems combined with ballistic missiles to launch massive strikes that could cripple the operations of forward deployed U.S. forces and their theater bases. To address these challenges, the Department of Defense must create a more resilient, survivable, multi-orbit sensor architecture that can detect and track both ballistic and low-flying hypersonic weapons and other maneuvering non-ballistic missiles and Q defenses against them. Today, our panel will discuss one option for a future missile warning and tracking architecture that could meet these requirements. Our report recommends shifting from a purely geosynchronous and highly elliptical orbit missile warning approach to a force design that consists of warning and tracking capabilities in multiple orbits, from low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, geosynchronous and polar. Further, to enhance survivability and resilience, we examine potential defensive capabilities, as well as offensive ones that when combined would serve to deter attacks on these constellations. To explain this all in more detail, we have the author of the paper, Christopher Stone with us today. Chris is the senior fellow at the Space Power Advantage Center of Excellence. We're also very fortunate to be joined by Colonel Miguel Cruz, commander of Space Delta IV the command responsible for missile warning in the U.S. Space Force, as well as Dr. Davin Swanson, Chief Engineer for Space and Command and Control at Raytheon Intelligence and Space. It's my pleasure to welcome you gentlemen to our forum today. So let's begin with the summary of the paper. And as a note to our audience, feel free to raise your hand using that function on the application or submit a question in the Q&A window anytime during the discussion and we'll try to get to those questions in the second half hour. But for now, over to you, Chris. Thanks very much, sir. Um, as I get the slides up here, let me just say it's a privilege to be with everybody here today to discuss this very important and critical issue to our nation's security. And um, this paper that's rolling out, as mentioned before, is, is talking about space-based missile warning and tracking. And the reason why we put together this paper uh, and I wrote it is for those of you who've been watching the news, uh, at least since the Syrian civil war, especially with also what's going on in the Ukraine, the era of missile warfare is definitely upon us. Um, despite our best efforts uh, throughout the 90s and 2000s to try to limit the proliferation of, of ballistic missile systems, short range and medium range, they've definitely proliferated and become a very a uh, very well-used uh, system by our adversaries, not just our great power adversaries, but also some of the more rogue nations like North Korea and Iran. One example that we're all familiar with is the largest missile attack uh, in U.S. military history upon U.S. forces was the Iranian launch upon uh, U.S. bases in Iraq in 2020. Uh, in addition to that, we are also dealing with a situation where our space threats are growing and expanding every single day, as General Thompson mentions in the quote below, and that any system that we deploy for missile warning and tracking must be capable of operating in a warfighting domain. 
And so because of this and because of uh, how our system was designed for primarily ballistic missile warning, and as General Chilton mentioned in the intro, a lot of our adversaries are now building uh, quite a few other options, such as low-flying depressed trajectory missiles, as well as hypersonic missiles and even air-breathing low flyers. It, is, it behooves us to be able to improve not only our warning capability, but our tracking ability. So a quick background on our current architecture and where we, where we come from. Uh, our current system is a combination of ground-based radars and a predominantly geo and geo-based uh, space-based infrared sensor system. This, was, uh, this goes back to the Cold War period where initially um, our ground-based radars were geared toward uh, bombers flying over the pole from the Soviet Union in support of NORAD and Strategic Air Command. But with the advent of ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, that cut down the hours of notice that we had with our ground-based radar system to mere minutes. And with the launching of the first um, space-based missile warning architecture, MIDAS, in the early 60s, that gave us the ability to increase our warning time to at least a half an hour or so, depending on where the missiles were launched from. As we progressed through the Cold War period, our space-based uh, infrastructure at GEO became more and more advanced and updated based on the requirements of the time. And after the Gulf War in 1991, uh, we saw that growth of theater ballistic missiles such as SCUDs and others that led to the need to update our sensors to be capable of not just doing global missile warning or at the time called strategic missile warning, but also theater missile warning to help cue missile defenses such as the Patriot PAC-3s or what we have now with the THAAD. So currently, we operate phase array radars, theater radars, and a space-based infrared system known as SIBRs. However, these all reflect past threat requirements and not our current threat requirements that we're seeing. So because of that, of the outstanding use of this system throughout the last couple of decades, our adversaries have begun to design their new missile systems to exploit the gaps in our current missile warning architecture. As you see with the bottom right picture, it shows the difference between a ballistic missile trajectory of which our ground-based radar systems were based on tracking, as well as our boost phase uh, infrared space-based systems. And a, a ballistic missile flies very high to its apogee in space where it's able to be tracked by the ground-based radar and cue ground-based missile defenses. However, when you look at a hypersonic glide vehicle trajectory seen in the red, it clearly shows a gap in radar coverage just because of the exploitation of the curvature of the Earth. And because of that, it creates a serious problem that with the high speed missiles or even a low trajectory missile separate from the hypersonics, it makes it to where it almost is too late to cue anything once the radars pick it up. Now, these missiles obviously include everything from hypersonic boost glide, air breathing, scramjet weapons, cruise missiles, all sorts of variety of missiles, not just the ballistic missiles that we have today, um, primarily that we're, we're designed for. But these lower altitude flyers and that others that can maneuver create challenges to our ability to sense. And this deals with not just conventional missiles, but also potentially the long range missiles that can have nuclear warheads on them. A couple examples include the Chinese DF-17 and the Russian avant-garde hypersonic boost glide weapon. In addition to that, as I mentioned in the, in the first opening slide, the U.S. must be capable of operating in a warfighting space domain. So a lot of our missile warning assets and other satellites for that matter were designed in the late 90s for a more benign environment, um, whereas our adversaries at the time didn't really have a whole lot of capability to hold it at risk, GEO being at the time one of the more safer orbits to base things. But now that's not the case. China and Russia have developed and deployed in many cases and used uh, counter space capabilities across the continuum kinetic and non-kinetic to exploit the vulnerability of critical space infrastructures like our missile warning architecture and GPS and others. Um, as a result, this, this multi-layered attack architecture as the Chinese refer to it, gives them options to attack or to deny what they call hard to defend and easy to attack systems. Uh, on the kinetic side, GEO is not out of the realm of possibility. Obviously, low Earth orbit and MEO are easier to reach by the Russians and the Chinese missiles that we've seen. But in 2014, they at least demonstrated the ability to reach out to GEO um, as well. So depending on which weapon and what the conflict might be, we must be prepared for a whole suite of counter space assets as well 
as being able to deal with the missile threat. So bottom line, as you see here on the left, our current missile warning system, uh, the, the report looked at several attributes, global coverage, resilience, and survivability against the full counter space threat, persistent warning of missile launches, persistent tracking of the hypersonic, low flying, and other types of missile systems that can maneuver. And uh, also we looked at the potential for defensive measures, which we currently do not have the kind that we talk about in the paper, such as rapid maneuver, decoys, and active defenses, which we'll get to in a little bit. But when you look at the current system, we have global coverage and we have persistent warning of missile launches with, a, with, with also a dual capability to, to monitor theater specific as well as global simultaneously. But our resiliency and our survivability against the full, full threat and our persistent tracking is lacking. So we're not really designed for today's space and missile threat environment. The good news is, is that we've had several agencies over the last couple of years looking at this problem from various different concepts. So you have the Space Development Agency, which will soon become part of the Space Force, but is still separate at this time with their National Defense Space Architecture tracking layer, which is a proliferated low Earth orbit system, which we'll look at in more detail in a minute. Missile Defense Agency with their Hypersonic and Ballistic Tracking Space Sensor, or HBTSS, which is also a proliferated LEO tracking system uh, for helping with fire control of missile defenses. And then the Space Force is looking at um, medium Earth orbit options uh, to aid with tracking and warning, as well as the next generation OPIR, which is essentially the, the next generation version of SIBRS. Now I will mention also before I move on is that um, before the Space Warning and Analysis Center was stood up to sort of integrate this into a force design, all of these agencies and, and the companies working on them uh, were looking at it from a more of a competitive development to aid in the debate of which option is the best option. And so this report provides a solution to that uh, different from what the SWAC might be looking into. So our solution that, I, that we propose in this paper is a multi-orbit uh, version. So basically taking the best of all three orbital concepts, combine them into an integrated tracking architecture with the capability to achieve all those required attributes that we mentioned before, uh, at least in some respect. So as you can see here from looking at the different orbital altitudes and the fields of view, some of the positives of the low flyers um, also don't meet the positives of the geo and vice versa. So if you look at the low earth orbit, it's the closer to the earth you are, the higher fidelity you have because you're able to see things clearly, track things clearly. You're able to, uh, the, the tracking of a missile threat at LEO is between five and 10 minutes, uh, small field of view, but high threat as we'll get to later with regards to the counter space thing. As you move out to MEO, uh, it's medium fidelity. Um, it's better than from geo, depending on which orbital altitude you're at. Has a larger field of view than the LEO satellites and, and moderate tracking from minutes to hours. Hours being more for the, the low flying cruise missile types. And then when you get out to geo, it's still really good IR. It's the best there is right now, but it's lower fidelity than you are when you're closer to the earth. Medium threat, still at risk, but not as risky as lower orbits and it has a global coverage, which each, each SIBR satellite covering about a third of the Earth uh, per vehicle. So right now we're gonna go through each of these, these basing concepts and, and what we assessed it to be. So with the LEO base, based concept, um, Space Development Agency working now with the Missile Defense for HBTSS, it's a uh, multiple satellite constellation for high fidelity infrared tracking of maneuvering threats. Uh, it consists of anywhere from 20-some to hundreds of satellites in its full operational configuration. That uh, high numbers uh, creates the ability for added resiliency, but also um, enables it to hand off to various satellites for continuous tracking of, of high maneuvering missiles. In addition to that, they, they launch um, good enough type of technology, not looking for perfect, so you can update it as the technology advances in two to three year tranches. Uh, but as I mentioned before, despite that resiliency in numbers, when you're dealing with an adversary that's building potentially a very deep uh, magazine, if you will, of, of kinetic weapon systems, stating the will to use them, such as the Russians and maybe even the Chinese, um, you're definitely at risk of, of the full suite from high-powered microwaves, jammers, things of that sort at low Earth orbit. 
So when you look at adding low Earth orbit uh, options to the geo uh, options, you can see that we maintain a good global coverage. Um, the persistent warning of missile launches remains and increases uh, for yellow resiliency increases because you have now not just one orbit of multiple numbers, but you have depth of, of that with, with multiple orbits. And then your persistent tracking begins to improve because you have those low Earth orbit options to, to track. Looking at the MEO basing concept, this required, this gives us longer tracking time than proliferated LEO, higher fidelity than GEO, added resiliency for LEO orbits. Most uh, of the LEO advocates think that a MEO option would be good uh, as a redundancy backup uh, for backfilling and things as well. And it provides other coverage because of the higher altitude. It, as any orbit is, you're at risk of counter space threats, less so than LEO because it requires more power for some of the more reversible side to get out that farther. And the further you go, it just requires more, more tech know-how. Um, most of the design for people who are advocating for MEO to be a by itself approach is anywhere between nine to 36 satellites for global coverage. If you fully integrate MEO with LEO and GEO, you don't necessarily need as many satellites. It just depends on how much fidelity you need, how much uh, assurance you want, and how much resiliency you need um, is will base the, the, the numbers of the satellites. And again, MEO is basing altitude between 2,000 and 35,000 some odd kilometers. So when you add LEO, uh, MEO, and next-gen GEO without the defensive measures, you see global coverage remains good. Resiliency remains pretty good at, at a middle of the road approach, better than it was by itself. Uh, persistent warning remains green and, and great with a little bit of extra help from MEO as a backup. And then persistent tracking of hypersonic low flying missile systems uh, improves as well with the addition of the MEO options to help support LEO. However, um, I'll just briefly talk about GEO. The, the current new next-gen OPIR will consist of five satellites in GEO and two in polar orbit. Um, this, as well as the, uh, the LEO architectures, are designed to be open, meaning that it's designed for future connection to ground-based fusion of the data, as well as potential communications with other systems, such as the transport layer that SDA is working on to try to uh, improve the speed and resiliency of the communication relays of the data to the tactical users and improve sensors and increase downlink capabilities. Uh, as I mentioned, GEO used to be sort of the safe orbit, but it's, it is still less at risk of some counter space threats than the, than the lower orbits, but it's still at risk as we saw in 2014 with the kinetic th threats as well as some of the others. So if you include, um, because of, of the fact that MEO and GEO um, have longer period orbits, um, GEO obviously matching the rotation of the Earth, um, and LEO being obviously about an hour and a half, you know, depending on the altitude. Um, adding defensive measures such as decoys to low Earth orbit, um, active, uh, active maneuvering, more rapid maneuvering using more advanced uh, propulsion than the current um, uh, propellants that can be wasted really rapidly in a conflict situation because propellant is typically designed per satellite for a certain lifespan to keep it in its assigned orbits. It's not really designed for a lot of, or, of orbital maneuvering. Um, you can do some, but not a lot in a conflict. So moving the GEO and the MEO to having the ability to rapidly maneuver with more advanced propulsion, I think would be also good in helping make it even harder on our adversaries to target these assets uh, as well. So active defenses on board the vehicle as well would be great in addition to its hardening that it already has and the cybersecurity um, actions that have been put in a new system. So with all these, you see that the resilience and survivability increase when you add those, those active defensive measures uh, than just re relying on taking hits and resiliency by itself. And so that's with, with what we recommend is, is uh, we think the best option. Now it's great to see, um, we obviously agree with the Secretary of the Air Force, Frank Kendall, that there's really no more important area to prioritize than missile warning and tracking. And I think you're seeing some of that in the 23 budget, but the, the four recommendations that this report shows is that we believe that adopting a multi-layered architecture, combining the legacy ballistic missile warning capabilities with enhanced sensors in LEO, MEO, GEO, and Polar will help us to be able to detect and track 
both the hypersonic weapons and other novel missile threats that we mentioned, such as the depressed trajectories and others across their entire flight profiles. Uh, we also believe as part of enhancing from just the resiliency by numbers to add numbers, but also decoys uh, in Leo and Mio to complicate Chinese and Russian counter space targeting. I believe this would also enhance deterrence and increase resiliency on top of what we're already looking at with resiliency and numbers in a conflict. Also, as I mentioned briefly before, um, transitioning the Mio and Geo missile warning and tracking satellites that use chemical based repellents with limited lifespans to more advanced propulsion capabilities are a good option to enhance their ability to maneuver to avoid attacks and also to change orbits post attack for backfilling or any other mission needs. And then finally, as General Chilton mentioned in, in his opening, um, and, the, and the paper also mentions, is that as part of the active deterrence measure, um, in addition to complicating it and adding that depth of resiliency and survivability, we should have our own ability in sufficient numbers to hold adversary space systems at risk, given the viewpoint of the adversary itself. So when you're building a system, not only do you wanna handle the threat tactically and operationally, but you need to look at it from a strategic standpoint, understand the adversary's perspective of why they're, they're building these systems to defeat our current system and build a system that, that's counter to that and makes it more hard, uh, more difficult for them to achieve their objectives. And if our deterrence fails, then we have the ability to win in our, our situation. So with that, I'm looking forward to the discussion, sir. And at that point, I'm looking forward to the questions. Great, Chris. Thanks for a super overview of your paper. And I'm sure that uh, there's gonna be a lot of questions that uh, we'll be fielding here to uh, address many of the points you, you brought up. I, I'd like to uh, first though, uh, give uh, Colonel Cruz an opportunity to share some of his thoughts. Uh, he's the man at the tip of the sword there. Uh, with the mission set today, and uh, and I'm sure you have some thoughts, Colonel Cruz, on, on what we need for the future. Yes, sir. Well, thank you so much uh, again for the uh, for the invitation. Thanks to Mitchell and thanks to the audience for their uh, participation. Great to be here uh, again um, on a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, as you very well uh, point out. Um, I think, uh, as Chris alluded to very well. Um, the new reality is the space is a warfighter domain is a thing. That's that's why the re that's the reason why the service was created. That's the reason why the combatant command was established. Uh, and so over the last couple of years, the service has done a lot of good work in establishing guidance and direction and doctrine uh, to help steer the service in that direction. Just to give you a sense, the CSO's planning guidance, I think, mentions warfighting about 18 times. Our very own capstone publication uh, mentions it about 23 times, uh, and I was telling General uh, Whiting the other day how his very own uh, uh, strategic intent document mentions it about 21 times. So obviously it is an important topic, um, but I think we can also agree that realizing that and operating as warfighters in a warfighting domain is something that we still need to realize. Um, in my perspective, as an operational commander, there's, the service is approaching this in the, as a three-prong approach, if you will, very simplistically, uh, explain. The first one has to do with how do we define what it means to be a warrior? In other words, who are we, right? The second one, and that has to do a lot with the cultural components like the ethos and approach and demeanor and how do we uh, define who, who we are. The second one has to do with um, how do we define the conduct of war fighting? How do we fight? Uh, and that has very much to do with tactics, techniques, procedures, operational uh, or operations uh, design, uh, mission planning, and, and the like. Those two are very near and dear to me because I, it is my job as a commander to make sure that we move along on those uh, in, in line with what the service has determined. The third one is very germane to the particular topic here today, which is the material solutions that will provide the operators, the warfighters, uh, the tools to be able to operate in a warfighting domain. And so that is very germane to, uh, to what we have uh, discussed right here. I spent a lot of time on the first two, uh, and I do so because uh, I believe we have come to the point where we have uh, realized what, at least in my mind, is a significant change in the character of conflict in the, as it pertains to missile warning, missile tracking, and missile defense. And that is, of course, I'm referring to, as, uh, as uh, uh, Chris alluded to, hypersonics, uh, maneuverable vehicles and all those other uh, systems that uh, Chris was uh, was referring to. 
uh, that are, in my mind, purpose-built to get after our kill chain, right? We very much operate in a sensor-to-shooter uh, type of environment, right? And one, something that I like to uh, mention to my operators is that in, in this war fighting domain, mm -hmm. what missile warning and missile tracking means is that we are very much the spotter to a sniper. And that just because we don't get to pull the trigger, we are less of a warfighter. And so that's as we're trying to inculcate that mentality. So, so we're very much part of a missile warning, uh, missile tracking, sensor to shooter kill chain. And those um, advanced threats that Chris was describing are purpose built to get after and disrupt our kill chain. So those are things that, uh, that keep me up at night. Um, if I think about uh, how we can as a service um, and as a joint force uh, tackle this, you know, and look at things like interoperability between uh, DOD, IC, maybe even commercial sensors. I know in this particular mission area, uh, commercial is not an area that we have necessarily explored much because of classification and so on. We have in SATCOM and navigation and other areas. I think it's probably uh, prudent that we, uh, that we take that into consideration. Uh, I would say, as, as the topic suggests, a multi-layer approach to tipping and queuing that considers non-traditional sensors will probably be another uh, approach uh, uh, to that as well. And, um, and, and perhaps from my perspective too, something that we can control, those, those are joint and service uh, answers to, that, to this particular challenge. From my perspective, the way that we try to do that is uh, by applying uh, fundamentals that are already very common in the joint force, mission planning, debriefing, MDMP, right? Military decision-making process uh, within our construct, within our processes, um, so we can get after uh, that, uh, that particular threat. So um, very much looking forward to the discussion. Thanks for the opportunity. And uh, we'll see what questions we have here in a little bit. Great. Thanks, Colonel Cruz. And again, thanks for participating today. Uh, Dr. Swanson, um, uh, we'd love to hear your, your thoughts on some of the technical attributes that highlight the benefits of a multi-layered approach. Sure, thanks, General Chilton, and, and thanks to, to, to Mitchell as well um, for the invite here. I'm honored to be on this panel talking about a, uh, a, a critical topic here as, uh, as adversary threats continue to develop. This area is just becoming more and more critical to make sure that we're uh, we're giving the warfighter the right capability to, uh, to, to, to stand up and meet them. Um, so this multi-layered architecture for missile warning and missile tracking, I, I think there's three things that I, I, I nail this down to in terms of the, the technical side that are enablers um, and benefits for this kind of multi-layered approach. Um, there's the resiliency aspect, uh, mainly through orbital diversity of the multi-layered approach. Um, Having a multi-layered approach allows you to tune uh, the sensor designs of each layer uh, according to kind of the optimal portion of that missile warning, missile tracking requirement set, depending on, on the orbit uh, that that sensor is in. And um, it requires and it allows a shift away from uh, the current uh, um, paradigm of a small number of high, you know, exquisite high value assets to a more proliferated architecture where you've got more vehicles different orbits and there, there, there's some benefits to that and some enabling technologies that let us let us get there. So um, starting with the resiliency piece, uh, the current HEO and uh, GEO missile warning baseline, um, adding, adding the two other layers, the proliferated LEO, MEO layers to that, adds just inherent resiliency through having not all your eggs in one basket, having, having multiple, um, multiple orbits and uh, multiple areas where you're fielding your sensors. The PLEO, uh, you've got strength in numbers, right? Uh, the, the PLEO architectures like SDA is building uh, have, have a, a lot of satellites, a lot of sensors compared to the current architecture, uh, but they are the closest to Earth. Uh, they're arguably the most vulnerable to the air array of, of adversary countermeasures that are out there, some of which Chris mentioned in his, his talk. Um, it's easiest to get things into LEO. It's fastest to get things into LEO. And just being closer to Earth has some uh, in inherent danger to it. Uh, it's a more dangerous environment in general uh, for our assets, but, but you do have those strength in numbers at, at LEO. Going up to MEO, you're further away, uh, not, not completely safe, uh, not as safe uh, as GEO for some threats, but safer than LEO. It's also relatively open territory compared to uh, the, the geosynchronous belt and the 
uh, the range of the typically crowded LEO altitudes where you've got a lot of, especially now commercial proliferated constellations starting to crop up. Uh, there's no standard MEO orbit or altitude. Chris mentioned the kind of 2,000 kilometer to 35,000 kilometer range. There's a lot of area to uh, to deploy in, and um, the, the the adversary would have to to field um, you know field threats threats within in order to to uh, to address everything all at once. So that orbit diversity piece just inherently gives you some resiliency uh, when you go to that multi-layered aspect. Uh, the other, the second thing I mentioned was tuning designs for the optimal portion of the requirement set. So uh, we've been talking about missile warning and missile tracking, right? Uh, before the seminar started, uh, Colonel Cruz made a comment about how uh, we talked about these two different sets of requirements, but they're really two classes of requirements inside one um, mission area, which is that end-to-end -end kill chain that, that, that he supports, right? Um, but right now, the, the current assets are focused on missile warning up in GEO and, and, and HEO. Uh, the missile tracking pieces of the requirements, uh, you've got a lot, you've you got the ability to meet some of those requirements for, for dimmer targets um, for lower latency at, at the lower altitudes at, at LEO and MEO. Um, and, and a sensor that you design for boost phase warning might look very different than a sensor you design for post-boost tracking. Uh, that the warning mission, you're concerned with with finding those initial launch bright boosting targets. You might be looking below the horizon, above the horizon. There's a timeliness requirement in reporting. Um, on the defense tracking side, you've got dimmer targets, these hypersonics that Chris mentioned, non-ballistic targets. Uh, uh, in some cases, some very tight latency requirements because of the maneuverability of those 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 uh, those targets. And um, and the target signatures are changing according to the different phase of flight. When we talk about dim targets, uh, those dim targets we're looking at are only at their dimmest phases part of the time, right? So you don't necessarily need the, 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 the most exquisite dim target tracking sensor 100% of the time, right? You don't want to design your, your tracking piece of your architecture just for one, one corner case, right? Um, so in general for those dim targets, you're Closer is better. You get better sensitivity to get to those those dim signatures, but there's a trade-off with the number of satellites. Right, higher altitudes, you get more coverage per sensor. Uh, it's it's easier, less complex to maintain custody of of these targets without multiple handoffs between sensors. But potentially, you can get less performance. Right, um, for for equal performance as you go up in altitude, typically your swap is going to go up. Your your size, weight, and power of your payload and, and of your space vehicle, your launch mass to maintain that level of performance. So, so really you've got different orbits maybe optimized for different portions of that requirement set. So having that multi-layered architecture lets you, lets you optimize for that. And the last piece is this shift from a small number of exquisite high value assets to these proliferated constellations. Um, right now we've got a small number of very capable, you know, world-class, best-in-class sensors that we, that we fielded on orbit. But they're big, they're expensive, they take a long time to develop, they take a long time to field, right? And losing one of them can create significant capability gaps, right? So um, some of those problems with uh, capability gaps that I mentioned with the inherent resili resiliency of multiple orbits is solved as you field more vehicles. But you go down to those lower orbits, Leo Mio, you need more vehicles, right? Um, so in order to enable that, practically, you need to lower the cost, and to do that, typically you're lowering design life as well. You know, you don't have these long life uh, assets anymore. You're dealing with some uh, shorter life and kind of uh, higher mission risk class, like Class B, Class C type vehicles. So, um, there's a couple strategies uh, to enable that. The, the lower cost piece, um, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing offerings, you know, the SDA um, uh, tracking layer uh, missions and the the, 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 the MEO demonstration mission that uh, Space Systems Command is running right now, um, they're looking at, you know, looking at miniaturized sensors, less exquisite. They need to get the job done. They don't need to be the best sensor ever flown, right? Um, but they need to get the job done. Um, so uh, going to these smaller sensors, leveraging some new commercial space practices, establishing production lines, so we have less stoppage on and off, you know, starting a development of these big high value assets and then production line going cold for years while you develop the next one, keeping that production line going and a, and a line of these sensors rolling off the line uh, really gets, gets you some cost advantages.
And that shorter design life where you might think is, well, that, that, that could be an issue, right? You know, it's better to have longer life sensors than shorter life sensors. Well, that allows more frequent te technology insertion. You can update the technology more quickly, and that goes back to reinforce. You don't have to have the best, most exquisite sensor launched. You need something that gets the job done, knowing you have an opportunity a few years down the road to upgrade that technology and to keep up with the threat, right? And with all the new entrants and space launch, um, that's getting launch costs down. So that allows you to launch those vehicles on a quicker manifest and a, uh, you know, for, for an achievable cost, right, an affordable cost. So those are kind of the three things, that the resiliency through orbital diversity, um, the ability to tune the designs of the sensors and the different layers, the different uh, portions of the requirement set, and the ability to shift that architecture away from that small number of high-value assets to more proliferated uh, constellations that, that, that let you uh, insert new technologies as needed. So, so I, I think this is a fascinating area, um, and I think it's, it's both something that's important for the nation that we're keeping up with, and it presents a lot of interesting technological problems to solve. So I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be a part of it. Great. Well, thanks, Dr. Swanson. And I, I'd like to footstomp something you said, um, the, the practicality and affordability of this type, these types of architectures has really been driven by the decrease in launch costs. And uh, that has really opened up uh, the opportunities to start thinking about these new types of architectures. Um, and I just, a few words here before we go on into um, q and A. I can't overemphasize the important role that Space Delta IV plays in supporting our combatant commanders. They provide the initial alert of an attack to the regional commanders, which allows them to shelter forces and cue their defensive systems, such as THAAD, Patriot, Aegis. And in the case of the homeland, our GBIs in Alaska and California for attacks originating from North Korea, uh, not to mention air defense forces. Um, the STRATCOM commander um, also depends on Space Delta IV or in his role as a, a key advisor to the, to the president on potential courses of action for attacks on the homeland. So it's just, it, it, Space Delta IV is just so important. And it's, uh, I would echo what everyone's saying here. It's so important as we go forward to make sure they have the tools necessary to continue to the great work they've been doing in the past. Um, so with that, I'd, I'd like to jump into the Q&A and I'll take, uh, host privilege here to begin with. And Colonel Cruz, I'm going to put you on the hot seat first. Um, you know, as the Space Force's lead for all things missile warning, can you explain from an operator's perspective why a shift from missile warning to missile warning and tracking is important? And in addition, would you share your views on the advantages and disadvantages on the multi-layered approach? I know you've already talked a little bit about that, but if you have any thoughts on disadvantages, I'd, I'd love to hear those as well. So, well, thank, thanks very much uh, for that. It was interesting to me, the question, because, um, you know, at least in my mind, we have been operating on this missile warning, missile tracking, and quite frankly, missile defense. I find it very difficult now to, to speak about missile warning and missile tracking without missile defense. It's all part of the same concept. It's, it's part of what we call the kill chain, that sensor to shooter uh, kill chain. And so, um, I think uh, to what I alluded to in the, in, at the beginning, I think it's, it comes to the realization, right? Missile warning is about bell ringing. Missiles are coming, dock and cover, right? Um, missile tracking is about custody of a target. It's about being able to look at that target and pass that information to a shooter that will, will uh, engage it. And so there's, there's a nuance right there. Um, I think in our culture, as we're moving forward, the realization that we're not just bell ringers, that we're actually contributing to uh, a much broader, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, engagement. Uh, as far as the uh, multi-layer approach, I think uh, Chris mentioned some of our competitors are having a multi-layer attack uh, architecture. And so it kind of makes sense to me to have a multi-layer approach uh, to that. Um, as, I, as I listen to Dr. Swanson, I think what I take from his commentary is that there's an inverse relationship between the level of exquisiteness of a sensor and uh, uh, for a missile warning and tracking systems and a multi-layer and even more proliferated architecture. And so um, to me, I think uh, from the service perspective is probably a, a discussion about how much risk we're willing to take and how much money we're willing to spend. Um, as an operational commander, uh, I'm quite agnostic as far as what the particular solution is. I will tell you what I need. What I need is to be able to detect missiles very, very, very quickly. 
I need to be able to maintain custody for the entire path of that uh, trajectory. I need to be able to discern what the intent of that uh, missile is and pass that information to a response element, whether it is in theater, like you mentioned, a THAAD, for example, or uh, uh, or a GBI for a strategic uh, uh, mission. And then the, over, the always important assessment aspect post-engagement, which we also are a part of. So that is what I care as an operational commander. And I want to do that in as short of a period of, of time as I can. Of course, I'm not even touching on the command and control aspect of that, that Delta Five takes care of, but I know they worry about those kinds of things, right? So, um, so very interesting to see, I think a multi-layer approach uh, gets us uh, at least a discussion into what's, uh, what's important. Um, I'm not particularly bothered by, uh, there's some benefits to a competitive approach to development, so long as at some point we meet in the middle and we figure out what's the best of each one of those, uh, and then we go, uh, we go to bat. So. Thanks Thank for that you. question, sir. Thank you very much. Chris, turning to you, um, in your presentation, you mentioned the, in your view, the need for defensive capabilities, whether they be um, increased maneuverability, uh, decoys, or uh, defensive, other defensive systems to add to the resiliency of the constellation, as well as potentially offensive capabilities from a deterrence perspective. Uh, can you tell us why you assess these capabilities to be important to the multi-layered architecture? Sure, um, whenever you look at, as I mentioned in the, in the opening, um, whenever you look at, at a design, a force design, you have to look at it not just from the tactical, I'm, I'm sensor to shooter, I'm, I'm taking advantage of, of whatever that, that threat is and trying to find a solution to that threat. You have to look at it from a strategic perspective and what the adversary thinks. And the adversary in this case, China and Russia both have a, a viewpoint that is space is more of a big sky and they're not as worried about some of the other issues that we are such as uh, our preference for more non for more reversible uh, counter space capabilities than the the more kinetic side and with the Russians you know saying that they're willing to take out all 28 plus spares of the GPS at Mio with kinetic weapons if, if so you know determined and then the Chinese rapidly deploying capabilities similar capabilities across the whole spectrum. Um, if you're going to deter the attack in the first place, resiliency in numbers alone is insufficient in my mind. You want to make it as difficult as possible for the adversary to target and to take out the ability to have that kill chain, as the colonel mentioned, operable. So having decoys to make, that, make them unsure of which targets at LEO it is, it's actually um, worth taking out. Um, that also probably gives us the, an illusion that, that we have more than we actually have to have, but they don't know that, and so they may be shooting a dud. With regard to the, the, the multiple um, orbits, that's defense in depth, as Dr. Swanson mentioned, and then having the ability to maneuver with those constellations higher up that have fewer satellites, I think it just makes sense given the um, advent of co-orbital ASAT systems, other systems that are capable of launching to that altitude and even doing rendezvous and proximity operations around those areas, I think it just behooves you to have that ability to avoid targets and even support other orbits with, with backfilling as necessary. And so because of just the way satellites have been designed over the years with, with those propellants, you know, being just designed for longevity of system and not for combat capabilities or environments, I think we need to adjust that to match reality. Thank you. I, I think if I could add to that, there's an opportunity to maybe flip the cost in, in position toward the adversary. Uh, you know, they have to expend more rounds to be effective. And uh, it's always good to be on the correct side of the cost imposing equation. And I'm not sure we're there today. So uh, thanks. Thanks for those thoughts, Chris. No problem. And if I could ask you a question, sir, since you obviously were the commander of U.S. Strategic Command, um, that was responsible for ballistic missile defense, space, and nuclear forces all at the same time when you were there. What do you think is the biggest challenges to achieving the type of multi-layered approach that our report talks about? Do you think it's technology, policy, funding, some combination of all or all the above? Uh, well, thanks, Chris. Uh, I'll, I'll begin by first saying, um, to as a STRATCOM commander, former STRATCOM commander, and I'm sure the current one feels this way, as well, uh, without this capability, you cannot deter. You need to be able to attribute the source of an attack. 
And your adversaries need to know that you can do that. And that is just absolutely fundamental to, uh, to deterrence. And, and so I can't, over, again, overemphasize the importance of the, having this capability. And so I, I think that's clearly recognized um, by warfighters and by policymakers that this is not something we can live without. And it is so important that we need to uh, take steps to not only make sure it's going to sur survive in a, the capability is going to survive in a war fighting domain, it's also going to be able to counter and warn of these new threats um, that are being developed by our adversaries. I don't think technology will be the pacing factor. I, I think the technology is there and I think we will continue to improve it. And with this architecture, we'll be able to update it more easily with reduced launch costs. costs. Uh, Funding is always going to be a, a custom discussed at, at levels. Uh, and, and I think Colonel Cruz nailed it. It's a risk trade-off about you know, how much you're going to put up and how you're going to do it. Um, and, and so I think that's where the big debates will be. But at the end of the day, I, uh, there won't be a debate on the need for these capabilities, in my view. And, uh, and so I'm very optimistic that uh, we'll press forward every combatant commander, whether they be the regional combatant commanders or STRATCOM uh, or U.S. Space Command, are going to uh, advocate for an approach that meets the uh, fills the gaps that we see coming going forward. Um, you know, we could, uh, we're approaching a time period here where I think it's going to be important to, to address some of the questions that our audience has. I don't want to steal all the, all the time uh, from them. So, uh, Chris, I'm going to ask you, if you would, to take a look at any of the uh, Q questions that have come in, either through uh, the chat or uh, other means, and, and uh, tee those up for us. Sure thing. So, again, if, uh, if you have a, a verbal question, just be, I, I would ask you to use the raise hand function so I could spot which one of you are like that. Uh, for the Q&A section, um, this question, the first one comes from uh, Josh Holliday. Uh, he says, some might argue that the U.S. not having the capability to detect and track these threats you've described, like low-flying and maneuverable weapons, could be an incentive to our adversaries to invest heavily in them and build even deeper magazines. How do you view this? And could building such a multi-layer space warning and tracking architecture be a cost-effective deterrent? Um, I guess we can start with uh, whoever wants to take that one. Maybe Colonel uh, Cruz, we'll start with you. Sure, we can we can do that. I think I think there's a there's something there's something to be said uh, about that. Uh, of course, our uh, potential adversaries and our competitors worry about their own cost and risk assumptions as well. Uh, and so um, they will try to maintain that strategic advantage to the point where it's feasible for them to do that. Uh, not addressing that will allow them to do that in a less risk and a less costly uh, manner, at least in my mind. Um, so us being able to stay ahead of the threat um, because of our uh, superiority in technology and of course, you know, our operators and the best partners in the world, uh, I think is the right, uh, is the right approach. Again, it goes back to how we want to approach it. Um, but to me, it just makes perfect sense uh, to develop uh, the capability to stay ahead of that threat. Like General Shilton alluded to, this is, not, this is a no-fail no mission. Failure in this mission area is directly related uh, to loss of life and property in ways that our nation and our political leaders cannot stomach. And so failure is not an option. Uh, and so keeping that, uh, keeping that advantage seems to me is the right approach. And Chris, I'd add, um, you know, adversaries are going to do what adversaries are going to do. I forget who said it in the Cold War. They said, when we, when we stop building, they build. <laughs> and when we build, they build. When we stop building, they still build. They're, they're going to do what they see as in their own best interest. And I don't think uh, it's a good argument to say, well, if, if we develop these defensive capabilities, that it's going to incentivize them to build more. If it's if it if that's the case, then it's going to be very costly for them, and they're going to be constrained, as Colonel Cruz just described. But uh, I, I think we have a responsibility. Our military has a responsibility to uh, feel this this capability for the reasons we've talked about, whether they be deterrence or actually successfully defeating attacks. Should deterrence fail? Absolutely. 
The, the, the next question we have here, I think might be good for, for Dr. Swanson. This is from an anonymous attendee. It says the Sivers constellation is very expensive. Will this concept uh, be affordable? Dr. Swanson, you have a thought on that? Sure. Well, it has to be affordable, right? I mean, as, as General Chilton said, this is a capability that there's a real threat here today and it's developing and, and we need to respond to it. I mean, Colonel Cruz talks about uh, what he needs to do his day job and the things that, that probably keep him up at night, you know, thinking about the, 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 those capabilities that, that he needs. So, um, so we have to find a way to make it affordable. And I think some of the things I mentioned when uh, talking about uh, the move towards proliferated LEO and MEO architectures, uh, there are a lot of uh, opportunities here for industry to follow some of the commercial practices that have been developed to, to build product lines, to use uh, lower cost, lower mission class, commercial type uh, uh, practices uh, to, get, to get more sensors on orbit uh, more cheaply and, and more quickly. So I think there are opportunities there and I think a path has been identified and that's largely what SDA is trying to, trying to, uh, trying to demonstrate that, that those uh, commercial practices can be leveraged to provide real military utility. So, um, so I think it can be, uh, it can be affordable and, and it needs to be. That's, uh, it's up to us to make sure that, that we find a way to make that happen. Awesome. Um, the next question is from John Watkins, and I think this could be probably for anybody, uh, but maybe more so Colonel Cruz or General Chilton. What are your thoughts on the utility and need for evolutionary adoption of AI um, to improve not only F2T2EA, which is find, fix, track, target, engage, assess for those who are curious about that, but also decision superiority? What are your thoughts on, on that? So we'll just be brief on this one, but I would say as, as we look at the speed of decision making, it's all about the speed of decision making, uh, tipping and queuing as well from one sensor to another, whether it is a squeezed sensor to a non-traditional sensor, and then tipping and queuing to the uh, response elements to get after that. And, and, and maintaining that close queue, uh, kill chain will require some type of uh, automation, some type of, uh, of, uh, of artificial uh, intelligence, I think that's, uh, that's pretty much a given. Uh, General Shilton, not, not sure if you have any particular thoughts on that. Well, you know, we, we've done it without artificial intelligence in the past, but with artificial intelligence, I think uh, we can do it much better. And I think, as you point out, the timelines are going to shrink with these uh, low-flying hypersonic uh, systems. And so uh, if we can improve the speed of decision-making using AI and improve situational awareness, the speed of gathering and attaining situational awareness, like what target is under attack specifically um, by adding AI capabilities, then we certainly ought to do that. Outstanding. So uh, this next question is uh, a little more about organizational structures um, from Kevin Humphrey, talking about how um, one of the ground-based sites, uh, and there's a mobile missile warning mission in the National Guard, and that there is a movement to move most of those guard space missions into the active space force. Um, if the space force did take over those two missions at Clear and in Greeley, Colorado, how would that impact uh, Delta IV's ability to get after orbital missile warning requirements that you just laid out? Would that have any any positive or negative impacts on your mission? I think there's a lot the, there's a lot of benefit and a lot of positivity that comes with that. You know, there's there's two fundamental doctrinal uh, precepts that we that we that we follow in the military: unity of command and unity of effort. And so when we when we establish the delta construct, we align each mission area on each one of those deltas for a particular reason, right? You put a no six as a as a responsible for that particular mission area. Um, as you know, in Delta IV, we used to have two wings. The 21st Space Wing had the ground-based radars. The 460th had the orbital aspect of that. We combined those two, and I've seen a lot of benefits um, to be able to see that, that enterprise, if you will. It's not the entirety of the enterprise, but it's a good portion of the enterprise. And so I think there's a lot of benefits uh, to that. Now, there's an argument, of course, um, to the scope and responsibility that that entails. Uh, I think organizationally, we can get after that by making sure that our staff and our organization is properly uh, organized uh, to be able to, uh, to fulfill the operational function as well as the management and administrative functions, uh, which we're getting after. Um, but I, I see a lot of benefits to that, to that construct if and when that comes to pass. 
Yeah, Chris, awesome. I'd, only, I'd only add that um, this is a uh, you know how how they're organized, how we organize those two units in particular, is is a debate that's happening right now. But what is not debatable is the criticality of the capabilities of, of those two units, and so uh, that uh, as a Stratcom commander, I absolutely relied on the readiness and performance of those particular units that you pointed out at, at Clear and Greeley. And so that capability cannot go away. Outstanding. So this question I think best fits maybe Dr. Swanson. Uh, Gary Montgomery asked, how would cyber attacks factor into the multi-layered architecture? Interesting, well, it's a pretty broad question, but um, you know, going back to, to the, the resiliency through numbers and through diversity, Point. Um, if you've got uh, you've got different sensors hosted on different space vehicles built by different companies, uh, run by different commands out of different sites, you know, all, we're moving more towards a, a distributed sensor architecture here, where you've got multiple sensors, um, both the current kind of exquisite sensors, some you know other 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 DoD assets and some of these new capabilities that are coming online that are all gonna be contributing information towards, uh, towards overall solutions, so towards overall uh, uh, tracking um, solutions that can, be, can, can queue, queue the, uh, the, the end users, the end game users. Um, and, uh, uh, but but having, having this distributed architecture means you've got, got more inherent defense because if you if someone finds a way into one piece of the system, they don't necessarily have a way into the whole thing, right? So I, I think having that diversity um, and having having uh, um, you know that that distributed architecture helps out with that. Um, does anyone else have any 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 comments on that one specifically? You know, I would I would like to offer something because I have uh, I have the blessing, if you will, to be uh, operating on, a, on an operations floor that has operations, intelligence, and cyber operators, cyber defense operators uh, operate uh, concurrently as a total force package. That's how we fight, as a total force package. Um, and our, our force uh, presentation concept is probably going to uh, address some of those things. From my perspective, cyber has to be baked into the uh, into the systems from development all the way down to sustainment. No ands and buts about it. It has to be part of that. We talk about artificial intelligence, we talk about innovation, we talk about technology, all that is tied by cyber. If you don't cook it in the, in the mix from the beginning, you're gonna to have a, to spend a lot more effort and a lot more time trying to get it into the systems at a later time when it's almost sometimes impossible to do that. So uh, so a big proponent of that, over. I think we have time for maybe one more. This one is from Taylor Garcia that says, how do we prevent the continued overcrowding of Leo while also introducing these new constellations and decoys, can you speak to space domain awareness? I'll, I'll just mention one thing, and I think Colonel Cruz or anyone else can add to this. Low Earth orbit, like MEO, is not super tiny. You've got several, you know, thousand miles worth of space from 50 miles up to about 3,000 some odd, you know, kilometers or so. And so most of the crowding is below the altitude that the SDA is looking at for their deployment of their tracking layer and other parts of their architecture. So that, that's something that, they're, that they keep in mind is to try to stay away from that. So it's a matter of sort of like Dr. Swanson said, maximize the use of the territory, if you will, in orbits around the earth. Um, but for you, Colonel Cruz or anybody else, General Chilton on the space domain awareness piece, how it connects? Well, certainly has a has a has a importance there. And in fact, I, I am a supporting supporting commander to Colonel Brock at Delta Two for the SDA mission, right? So, in fact, my Grand Base radar support that mission uh, day in and day out. So, I think it's very important. But I think you, you hit it on the head, uh, uh, Chris. It's you know, Leo is not as small as we think uh, or may think uh, that it is. Uh, but it does it does point out that there's a relationship between missile warning and other mission areas uh, as well. Uh, that as we develop this, these capabilities, we also ensure that our SDA capabilities are commensurate to be able to uh, maintain custody, not only of blue assets and red assets, but gray assets, right? So that's a, it's a, it's a combination of things. It's not only about missile warning. There's a lot of uh, interconnected uh, connected tissue, if you will, uh, on those two missions. 
Right. And I, I just add, you know, the space domain awareness mission set is going to be crucial to um, the defense of the missile warning architecture and the understanding of when you are being threatened and when what uh, actions you might need to take to increase your survivability when an adversary starts doing uh, co-orbital co type uh, or presents co-orbital type threats. And so uh, they're going to be tightly linked, uh, these two mission sets for sure going forward, uh, sometimes supporting, sometimes supported. And that'll, that'll flip back and forth between, I think, uh, those, those deltas. Well, Chris, I think I think we're about at the end of our our hour here, and uh, we've come to the, and I want to thank all our participants for participating in this event. and And Chris, congratulate you on your report. Again, it's titled "Orbital Vigilance: The Need for Enhanced Space-Based Missile Warning and Tracking." Um, for uh, those that joined us today, the paper is available on the Mitchell website now, and the video and slides should be up shortly. Uh, here probably later today. Again, uh, Chris, Dr. Swanson, Colonel Cruz, many thanks for sharing your insights into these issues. And from all of us here at the Mitchell Institute Space Power Advantage Center of Excellence, we wish everyone a great day. <laughs>